Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to the next session, New Narratives Empowering Stories. Uh, stories are life. Stories are everything. We can use stories for good. We can also use stories for, well, not so good. I'm very lucky to be able to moderate this session today with some wonderful storytellers and people who are out there making changes within stories that are making changes to the world. First, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Samuel Rubin. Uh, he was born and raised in Barcelona, but he's uh, based now in Los Angeles. He's a social impact producer, a narrative strategist, and a grassroots activist. He's the co-founder and impact officer uh, of the Hollywood Climate Summit, an international annual gathering that fosters multi-generational and youth-led story-driven efforts to showcase environmental action in the entertainment industry. Uh, for the past two years um, with the UNFCCC, uh, he's worked to form the Entertainment and Culture on Climate Goals and Solution. Uh, his work has been recognized by Forbes, Politico, he's, he's won various awards, um, and he also for Can You Hear Me? And he also co-founded the Yeah Impact. So if you please welcome to the stage the wonderful uh, Samuel Rubin. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful to be here. Amazing. So when we talked before, we talked about a lot of different things, but the first one, um, and often the focus in Hollywood, was green production focuses on production. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the big steps that have been taken in, in that area in recent years? Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I don't know how many of you watch films and television, but I assume it's probably the majority of you. Uh, probably in the recent years, you have noticed that we have way more content. It's hard to keep up with all the amazing shows out there. And now we have like Netflix and HBO and Amazon Prime and every single possible streamer out there. And so that has an increasing environmental cost. I think before answering what steps have we taken in the recent years, it's very important to contextualize that year after year, our carbon footprint in the entertainment and culture sector is growing exponentially. Uh, if you look at the chart of 2009 and 2019, it has nothing to do with each other. And so as a response, the studios and the production companies, they know that they need to include sustainability officers in their production teams. And a lot of the studios now have sustainability chief officers and green consulting agencies that they work with to make sure that their productions are less harmful to the environment. But we still are very far away from where we need to be. Uh, there is now, uh, I, I included here a picture of different production sets, no? because there is a very uneven distribution of resources right now. Mm -hmm. If you compare how can you greenify your production in Canada or in the UK or in the US, versus if you want to shoot a film uh, in anywhere in uh, India or maybe in the African region, there is not the same resources in place. And so um, this slide here actually shows you uh, uh, from the Albert, which is BAFTA's uh, Sustainability Consortium, they did a study uh, looking into the emissions of a temple film, mm -hmm. Indiana Jones or Star Wars or any of those big movies that we see at the box office. And one of those movies equals to 13 trips to the moon. So every time that we see Elon Musk launch one of those SpaceX rockets, add up 13 of them, and you have one big Hollywood movie. And as you all know, we don't just have one Hollywood big movie. We have a lot of big Hollywood movies, and increasingly more, because the industry knows that that's how they can make the most money. Mm -hmm. So that poses the question of how do we bring that number down? And the reality is that fossil fuels, transportation are the biggest uh, contributors mm -hmm. to the industry. So uh, 
In recent years, we've taken a lot of steps to create new calculators, new assessment methods, but we now have to figure out what is the infrastructure that we need in place in order to bring those emissions down. Amazing. Now, if we're going to empower, empower others outside of the industry, um, it's not just the production that we need to change, is it? We, we need to change the story that's being told. So what are some of the on-screen things, what the on-screen areas that we can work on? Yeah, I mean, on-screen starts uh, very early in the process when a writer or a producer or a director, beep, you know, a light bulb happens in, on the top of their head, and then all the way until the distribution process when we show that movie to the audiences, which is the reason why we're making content in the first place, is to show it to people and connect with the stories we want to tell. So. Um, there is a lot of phases and a lot of times we think that green production only happens in set and, oh, let's just take all the water bottles from set and that's it, we did it, suck the box. And that's not the case. A lot of times, uh, consideration that will take a big, that will play a big role in the production are decided during the development process. And if you write a film that has you and I in the middle of the car having a conversation and we're just driving in the middle of traffic, well, that's not, uh, there's nothing that we can do about it at the green production. But if the writer put that situation in a public bus or in the metro, you may even have more creative choices available to you because I hate when I watch a movie and the person is not watching at the wheel because they're like, oh, I'm talking to you and obviously I'm not looking at the road. So it's, it's very obvious that we could be doing a lot more and I uh, work with Good Energy, uh, which is a nonprofit, the first nonprofit to create a playbook uh, for climate storytelling so that the screenwriters have resources available to them to include more climate on screen. And they did a study uh, with USC Norman Lear, which was astonishing because we look at 37,000 plus scripts in television and screen, uh, uh, television and film, and we realized that only less than 2.8% of them had any climate keywords mentioned, and that include climate, obviously, uh, carbon footprint, drought, hurricane, and the curious thing is that when you look at all these different mentions, less than 0.6% of them are actually related to climate change. And even in the case of uh, extreme weather events, for example, only 10% of the extreme weather events that we see in our screens mention climate change mm -hmm. or make a direct connection to the uh, environmental crisis we live in. So that has to change, and it can change in a lot of ways. It can change by including simple placements on the screen. I don't know if you have seen um, A Quiet Place, uh, which is a movie that if you make any noise, they kill you. So I could not live in that world, clearly. But uh, they have solar panels on the rooftop because that's a quiet source of energy and they need to use that in order not to be killed. Not because they want to be environmentally friendly, no, but because it makes sense in the world that they are in. And the same can happen with little mentions, with the climate world building, and obviously the characters, because there is a lot of people here who are innovators, climate activists, solutionists, and you also have stories and deserve to have on-screen presence as well. No? I think for me the worst one is the, the, the typical American movie when the teenager comes downstairs and grabs a piece of toast and walk out the door and you can see all of that food left on the table and just think, my mum would never let me do that. Yeah. Um, so the next one, how can Hollywood be more representative of climate affected people? Well, that's a big question because I think that Hollywood has a lot of representation issues, not just in climate, uh, but all across the board. Uh, we probably all have seen a movie and seen someone that is supposed to be similar to ourselves and then realize, wait, that's not true. You know, that, that doesn't happen to me. Even from a love perspective, you know, like I realized that my understanding of romantic relationships was truly built upon Disney movies and, oh, a prince is going to come and save me and that hasn't happened yet. You know? And so we we need to understand that the narrative that we consume impact the decisions we make and our behavioral change. And we are not seeing 
narrative that accurately reflects the climate crisis we are in. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people that they will know what to do in a zombie apocalypse because there is so many movies about apocalypse of zombies, you know, and, and unfortunately we're not creating compelling, non-dystopian, optimistic narrative that give people tools and hope, hope to, to deal with the crisis we are in. No? And I think that one of the biggest important aspects to do that in storytelling is to remember that just as this slide here tells us that climate can be present in a myriad of forms, it can also be present in a myriad of genres. Mm -hmm. It's very important to include climate storytelling in comedy, in horror, in uh, sci-fi, in drama comedy, in family drama. One of my favorite movies last year was Costa Brava Lebanon, which is on Netflix, and I recommend all of you to see it. And it's about a family drama that features a family that live in Beirut, and they have to move to the mountains because there is way too much trash in the city. And when they move to the mountains, they build an illegal trash site right next to the green area where they move to. And it's kind of like a metaphor of like, well, they thought they were gonna get away from the trash and now they're stuck there again. And it's not a movie about trash. It's a movie about a family that is overcoming those issues, but you see it all the time, how that is impacting them and the representation of those issues in their character. So, so let's look at how, how things are changing, you know, how we're moving forward. So the Hollywood Climate Summit sounds pretty awesome. What is it? It's an amazing event and all of you here are invited to attend. It's going to be hosted next month, uh, June 21st to June 24th in Los Angeles. Uh, this is our fourth uh, annual edition of the summit. We started in 2020, which is a fantastic year to start <laughs> anything, of course. Um, but it was actually because we were going to do it in person uh, and then obviously the pandemic prevented that. But what was supposed to be an event for 300 people ended up being an event for 15,000 people all over the world. And that really speaks to the fact that Hollywood is an international brand, whether we like it or not and that it has a lot of power to bring global audiences together and push for issues that are planetary issues, like precisely the climate crisis. No? And so uh, these are some of the pictures of previous events at, Hollywood, at the Hollywood Climate Summit. We are going to be hosting it at the Academy of Motion Pictures, the Oscars this year. And this is pretty significant because we uh, want the Hollywood Climate Summit to stay. Uh, I'm the impact officer and co-founder of the summit, and so one of my jobs is to create the impact reports and to look at the partnerships and see what are the tangible outcomes that we see year round. And one of the tangible outcomes is having more than 240 partners from over 67 countries who are now collaborating all year round, making sure that the sustainable production process starts during storytelling, in the development process, and then carries through all the way to the audience distribution and engagement. And so we hope that the summit will be a space just like change now for the entertainment and climate community to come together and find our solution. I'm crossing my fingers, yeah. that's for sure. And, and, and by the way, uh, this is the link to get tickets. If anyone wants to get tickets, they can find them at HES Earth 2023 tickets. Online tickets are completely free and uh, it will be all live streamed and there will be Jane Fonda is attending and speaking about fossil fuels in the industry, the Daniels, which are the directors of Everything Everywhere All at Once, and a lot of amazing other speakers that I'm sure you will be interested in. I can't wait. Um, so how can we keep people and production companies accountable? Well. Uh, I'm not going to make a lot of friends by answering this question, especially since the studios also sponsor the summit. But um, the reality is that there is no accountability without transparency. And uh, that is the, the main goal of the Entertainment and Culture for Climate Action initiative that I'm in the convening team with the UNCCC. If anyone is more interested or would like to join the initiative, they can find out more at ECA that earth. And basically, um, to answer your question of accountability, the big issue that we have right now is that there is no regulation or policy requiring 
companies to disclose their carbon emissions inventory. So right now, it's very easy for a studio to say we are net zero by 2022 and publish a, a report on their website claiming that that's what they're doing, but there will be no accountability whatsoever for them actually having to prove that those emissions are true, meaning that that leads to greenwashing, lying, and, and manipulation of the facts, no? which is obviously something that in Hollywood they know how to do very well <laughs> because they are storytellers. So um, we have to increase transparency, and the UNCCC is a neutral institution that we hope can ask the companies to do that. Uh, I think we're not asking for that much. If you're saying that you're going to be net zero by 2030, great. Prove it. Yeah. And if you can't, uh, that's not so great, but at least be honest about it so that you can receive the mutual aid support that you need to uh, accomplish those uh, objectives. Because I think that something that we have seen um, with the Entertainment Climate Accord is that not everyone can reach the same goals at the same time. And that leads me back to the global equity piece at the beginning. This accord is not just for Hollywood, Canada and the UK. Right now, there is a lot of uh, data that shows that there is way more content production happening in Bollywood and Nollywood, India and Nigeria, and Nigeria than in the United States. And as you probably have noticed, in Netflix or other streamers, we have increasingly more international content because that is actually part of their business uh, strategy, to find subscribers outside of the places where they already have their biggest subscriber pool. So we do need uh, different pathways uh, adapted to different stakeholders and different regions, but we need transparency in ensuring that each commitment that each signatory is putting out there can be back up with facts and data. And then that data will actually give us the big picture of the sector, which right now we don't have. Because before I showed uh, Albert's uh, pie chart of carbon uh, pollution for uh, films and television, but that's just the UK in where they are doing it with more sustainability resources. If you look at a big volleyball production where maybe they don't have as much of the same infrastructure, that might be a different uh, total, and we don't have anywhere where we are aggregating that data like it's happening in fashion, in sports, or in other sectors. Amazing. So now we've got a minute and a half for a very big question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what is the end goal, and how are you going to get so many, like such a diverse range of people to work together in this industry? Well, it's, it's the same thing, no? It's like I, uh, we cannot expect everyone to do the same, and, and so the accord uh, has a framework, a hybrid um, format, which means that we are going to be asking everyone to be doing. Uh, to be signing an acknowledgement of the direction that the industry needs to be going to, which will include various goals such as decarbonization in alignment with the Paris Agreement, uh, storytelling and more climate stories on screen, as well as a protection of the biodiversity and the natural resources where we film at. You will be surprised if you knew all the damage that has happened in natural habitats because of films. It, it, it's actually astonishing. Um, but this slide here shows how the entertainment uh, climate action is interconnected depending on the various stakeholders. If I'm a producer, which I'm a producer, by the way, I will need to uh, request a permit to film a movie. And if that film commission here in Paris tells me, I will not give you the permit unless you follow those guidelines, well, that is accountability. That is uh, a check and balance that the film commission as an institution can put in front of producers, such as, for example, film funding. We have a lot of funding that comes from governments, and governments don't have the understanding of what should be the criteria to establish if a film is produ if a production is sustainable enough or not. So we're hoping that this accord uh, with the first part is going to provide acknowledgement for the entire industry, and then the second part will be individual commitments that will vary depending on what stakeholder type and what region are they based in. And this accord will be launched hopefully uh, this fall. 
And then at COP28 this year, we're hoping to have the first ever entertainment and culture pavilion in the Blue Zone, where we can bring together the stakeholders, the industry, and keep providing resources and information, as well as collaborating with policymakers, because we know that although the stakeholders cannot be doing things on their own will, we also have to create checks and balances from a policy standpoint too. Well, amazing. And I wish you all the luck in the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. Samuel Rubin. Thank you. We're going to continue. Um, we can see how to connect to, oh, it's, it's gone now. Uh, you can connect with uh, Samuel there. Uh, we now have uh, two further guests, one of whom will be up here, the other one will be here. Uh, so we have Flo Vassour, who writes books, portraits, stories, documentaries, TV series, scripts, uh, whatever, whatever the format, she works uh, to the end of the world as we know it. Uh, her first documentary, Bigger Than Us, absolutely incredible, by the way. If you haven't seen it, you absolutely must. Uh, it talks to young activists aged 18 to 25, fighting for human rights, climate, freedom of expression, social justice. Um, and that was selected at the Cannes International Film Festival um, and the Plus 35 International Film Festival. Uh, so Flora lives here in France, so please welcome her to the stage. She's the mother of two. Uh, And, and much like me, I believe, Floor, um, your, your children are the main source of your, your joy and, and also your concern. Yep. And we also have uh, Sigrid, who is, should be behind us. Sigrid Dijkjer, uh, she should be somewhere there. There we go, she is here, woo -hoo. Um, <laughs> Now, Sigrid Yay! is a producer. Now, she's produced over 30 documentary films. Um, the main focus today is on the territory, uh, which was was uh, released in 2022 at the, uh, she premiered it at the, the Sundance Festival. And uh, it's by Alex Pritz. It won two awards at the Sundance Festival. And we can now announce it also um, has a Peabody. And it was shortlisted for an Oscar as well. So thank you very much for joining us, Sigrid. Of course. Nice to see you. I'm in Copenhagen. She's in Copenhagen at the moment. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start with, with going with Flo here. Now, one of the first scenes um, in, in Bigger Than Us, one of the early scenes, has uh, it sees Malati in a, in a school that's been set up in Lebanon, and she's drawing stick images of, of ideas and, and people with ideas, and, and how that can spread and how it can move from one person to another and how one idea can have a, a huge impact. Now, I'd like to know how important is that scene in terms of the aim of the whole film? Wow, uh, thank you for remembering this scene. Um, well, I remember well when we shot this scene and, and it, it's, it's, it's a documentary, right? So you never ask your people to, to, to do something. It's really from Melati and her heart. And this is really, really profound to her and this is what she does. She's always telling me, you know, it's not enough to be an activist today or to be inspired. What we have to do is to educate each other. Uh, and so it's, it, this is really, really uh, major to me. Um, and we put that at the beginning of the film for people to understand that each and every story in the film will be uh, an opportunity for connection. And, 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 you know, sharing ideas, sharing stories, and how we inspire. And maybe we would never know. I mean, I myself, um, it's been, the, the film has been released 18 months ago. I'm still on the road every day to screen it because I'm really, really convinced that to beat the narrative that is all over the Netflix and the Amazons of these worlds, we have to connect again. We have to be in the same room. We have to start the conversation. You have to put your body on the line. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what this, this m magical drawing of Melati is saying. We never know what we trigger, but we have to try. And uh, that idea of, um, of discussion is something really important with, with Sigrid and the territory. Now, I, the film made me cry on, on more than one occasion. And, and there was one line that really stuck with me, Sigrid. And that was when, when Sergio was talking about uh, the Uruwawa people just living, you know, they're just living, they're not contributing anything to society. But, but it did have that opposite side of the view. It did have the, the view of the, of the land grabbers and, and so on and so forth. So 
I'd like to know, how did you manage to, to get the so-called, now I'm doing this very much in inverted commas, villains to, to speak about what they were doing? Well, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for actually being able to participate today, even though I'm sitting, you know, on the other end of Europe, uh, at least not the other end of the world. And yes, that was a, a very uh, difficult task and also not so planned in a way. We started the film with Alex Pritz going to the Amazon, meeting Nadinya and meeting the Uru Ewa Wow community. And he thought in his mind that the film was gonna be about the community, of course, and about this very young leader who's 19 years old at this time, and who is very aware and very interested in cameras and drones and technology that could actually help him to do surveillance of the territory. So that was his initial thought. And, and we actually felt lucky that we had a main character that was by himself interested in technology and not us arriving with technology and having this white uh, indigenous uh, sort of clash. So we, we fell in love with Beta Te because he was and is who he is. And actually he very fast said, well, it's fine if you want to do a film about me and my community and the fight we're doing every day to protect this forest, which is huge. It's the size of Costa Rica. So it's like, it's huge. Um, and there are only 180 people that are protecting this area. And he actually said, you know, it's fine if you want to do a film about me and my territory and my people, but we're not the problem. The problem is the other side, and we're not actually able to speak with them. So if you really want to make a genius movie, you should go visit the other side. And Alex was, of course, super worried, afraid he was going to get killed. He's a young American guy, and he didn't feel comfortable about it. But they said, don't worry, you're American. They'll love you. They love America. They love everything about Western movies by the way, and they love this whole idea that land is empty until you go and you conquer it. And the American dream is actually that idea. So he went because he was initiated by the his participants and co-collaborators, the Uru Ewa Wao community. Oh, amazing. It's, um, it's incredible that it was the suggestion of the other side to, to get involved, to make sure we had that whole picture. And something I found incredible about it was you could see that they were real people who, you know, they just wanted a better life for themselves. Now, both of the films show us... And that's also what the, that's also what the Uru Ewa Wao community were saying. They were like, we actually don't know what the problem is. And so if you could ask them, you know, openly why they're doing this and, you know, why are they actually cutting down the rainforest? And in the film, it's it's sort of twisted around. So it's actually the Uru Ewa Wao community that are the clever ones, the educated ones, the ones that say that there is a climate problem and mm -hmm. it's going to get even worse for all of you if you cut down our forest and we won't be able to protect it by ourselves. So the the you know, the, the land grabbers and the settlers, they think they're moving Brazil forward and they think that they can take care of their families, but actually they're cutting down the forest and that's actually eventually gonna kill their families in the long run. Yeah, and, so, and everyone yes, else's. We, we did it as, yeah, everyone else's. So we did it as an open, interesting, curious way of actually figuring out what were their thoughts and why were they doing this. Now, now, both of the films show, show us stories that, that don't only empower us watching it. They also show the, the empowerment of those people telling the story. So I want to know, Flor, how can we, we bring this to an everyday setting? Well, um, I'm on the document, documentary side. And um, I think it's uh, the idea of going at the other side of the world, shooting a film, capturing a story, coming back here, showing it to Cannes, and moving to something else is absolutely obscene. And we could not do that anymore. We have to commit to the people we are filming. We have to commit to our stories. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I was very impressed by the, the first uh, discussion here about how Hollywood 
is questioning its, its very role in, in terms of narratives and not only production. Uh, this is for everyone. This is for everybody here. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, it's such a privilege to do a film. It's such a privilege to go and meet people and spend time with them and to collect their story. It cannot, it's just the start of the adventure. And I know the territory has done a lot. And I was basically also inspired by one of the initiatives you had. Um, for me, the game is all about how you commit to the people you have filmed. Um, it's, it's really, uh, if not, you are trapped in this supremacy uh, of a production, uh, things that we are trying to change even here. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the core of the problem. So, for, for example, um, as far as Bigger Than Us is concerned, we have launched an NGO, Bigger Than Us Support, whose aim is to uh, support the protagonist of the film, so it's seven people, on the long run. Uh, so basically we started, uh, you know, as any business people here with financial support, but we said, no, it's just a small, sp small part. Uh, we realized that the biggest problem for um, the youth today, which they are the target of our film, is, um, is uh, mental health. Uh, and it's very, uh, so it's difficult for everybody, it's difficult for the youth, and it's even worse for young activists. So one of the biggest goal of our, of our support is to provide them a safety net, so whatever they do, they, they, can, they can rely on us. And I think this is very important, and this is our way to commit um, uh, to them. Um, and we also are going to go back in the film, in, in the field, uh, in their respective countries to do community screenings, as we have done here in France, we have done more than 4,300 community screenings and 500 debates, uh, it, there's no reason why we should focus only on our audience here in Europe uh, and not uh, do the same effort uh, and joy for the people we have initially filmed. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a follow-up on camera. We just do not know how, what's, what's going to be the end goal of that, but just we want to have the story to know what they have become because we have, sh we have uh, started the film uh, four years ago. So I think this is one way of answering the question is, okay, what is the whole point of doing films? Now, uh, you, you mentioned there about the impact and obviously the, the territory has won lots of awards. Um, congratulations again. But I, I'd like to know more, not about the awards and the glamour and the ceremonies. I'd like to know more about the impact. You know, so what yeah. is an impact campaign and how do you plan it? Well, I think for us, it was really, you know, the very first goal of this film. We asked ourselves, why should we go to the Amazon and make a film here? And as you were saying, are we exploiting people? Are we collaborating with people? Or what is really the goals here? And for us, it was definitely to create an impact. And I think that is a word that's being used all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've learned for producing all these films for many, many years is it's always good to figure out what are the goals, uh, what is the impact campaign exactly, what do we want to reach, and how do we want to do it. So we actually, already when we financed the film, we found partners where we said, if we go on and sell this film, are you able to, the investment you've put in, to actually, if you gain your investment back, will you reinvest into the impact campaign? And we were lucky to find uh, places like Luminate and Dark Society that actually reinvested the money once we've sold the film to National Geographic. So we actually had $500,000 to start our impact campaign, and that's much more than many film producers, film productions have. For us, it was not a campaign that was, you know, interested in how many eyeballs can we get on the film. That's, that's mostly what producers think. Oh, we're going to have millions of people watch the film and then we're going to do change. I mean, yes, maybe, maybe not. It's great to have a lot of people watch your film, but you really need to figure out what you want to gain from all this watching the movie. And so we actually spent quite a long time to go and speak with the Uruwewa Wow community, with other indigenous communities and say, okay, in the lucky, lucky, great world, we receive a lot of money for the impact campaign. By the way, there are co-producers. 
So they made equally much money on the film as we did selling to Nat Geo. There are our collaborators, our co-producers. They have money that flushed back into their funds as soon as we sold the film. So that's one thing. But the impact campaign, which is another thing, we actually asked them, what do you want to gain from this? And they said, we have two very important goals. We want to build a media center inside the rainforest because we want to make sure we own our own narratives and that we can control this narrative and that we can film what's going on in the Amazon and we can deliver that online with internet and CNN and everybody else can show how the rainforest is, is burning, but we actually want to produce it, direct it, cut it, and we want to make the money on it. Because that's the problem, is that they never were part of that money chain. And they need money in order to get new surveillance systems. Cameras deteriorate very fast in the rainforest. They need cars and they need interior for this media center that we've actually were able to build. So that was the first very important goal. We managed to have arms with the government in Brazil. So they were able to get the logs that were illegally logged in the Amazon and use those illegally logs of wood to build the media center from. The second goal they had was we want to change laws. We want to make sure that products coming from deforestated lands, that they are banned. And that that's a very big goal. And, and we had to use a lot of energy to figure out how do we get to politicians? How do we get into the EU? You know, because America, forget America, you can't like meet any politicians. They don't do anything unless they get a tons of voters. So we were like, we gotta, we gotta do Europe. And I'm a Dane and Denmark is very small. So you can very quickly get to Danish politicians. And the Danish politicians were crying when they watched the film and, you know, took that le legislation with them and said, sure, we're going to go back to Brussels and we're going to change this. And showing the film in Brussels to all the politicians, having our cinematographer, local cinematographer from the Uru Iwawao community flown in, doing a big speech at the, the EU parliament uh, in Brussels, right before the voting was going to happen, that just made sure that the law was voted in for and it's going to be implemented in Europe next year. And it's going to ban products coming from all deforestated lands. So not only in Brazil, also in Indonesia, in Africa, uh, Malaysia. And it's, of course, coffee and it's soy, it's wood, it's uh, palm oil. Uh, and it's, of course, the meat. Meat is the biggest sinner in all this climate storytelling universe. So I would say that, that we managed. Uh, and then the third thing was, of course, to have our indigenous community meet as many indigenous communities on the planet so that they didn't feel lonely. So, you know, when you are with Nat Geo and Disney, you get a huge Oscar campaign, and I'm not going to say the numbers here, but they are huge. And they would normally send out the filmmaker, the producers all around the world to promote the film. We said from the beginning, we don't want that. You are going to send the indigenous community out. They need to meet other indigenous and they need to feel that they're not alone in this world because mm -hmm. most biodiverse uh, land on this planet is guarded by indigenous communities and they need to feel that they are together and that they know about each other and that they do this fight together and that we all actually help them. If we protect indigenous, we're going to protect land. And that's, that's how the ecosystem actually works fastest, quickest and most sustainable. So we actually spend a ton of the money from the Oscar campaign sending our indigenous community to Australia, to New Zealand, to South America, to South Africa, you know, Greenland, wherever we could get them mm -hmm. out meeting other indigenous, that was the, the goal. So yes, we actually ended up raising $500,000. We could still need 200,000 because we wanna build an educational program for the media center where we have filmmakers 
maybe like you, uh, coming to uh, the Indigenous Media Center, sharing your stories, sharing your vision, getting to know their knowledge and how they actually work, because they are very, very clever filmmakers. They're not less clever than anybody else. So it's the sharing and the dialogue that we really want to make sure is happening. And we found an indigenous impact producer in Brazil. He's gay. Everything is amazing. And, uh, and he's really clever. And we want to be able to hire him for two years to keep running this educational program where we're also going to show the territory to both land grabbers and indigenous at the same time to sort of hold a dialogue between them, which is dangerous and difficult, but we really want to make sure that that's, that's happening. Well, exactly. So I could give you a lot of quotes and, <laughs> you know, numbers, but we, we've seen, we've had the film out in multiple countries and territories. So we're doing good in that sense, but Amazing. we really wanted to have a great impact campaign. And that, that dialogue is so important. And so I'm, I'm going to go to floor now. I'm, I'm wary of the time. Um, Last week, you were in Cannes, again. Um, what were you doing there? Well, it was um, it's a, an initiative, a collective initiative from the, from the inter entertainment industry here in France, where uh, it started at the, uh, in January. Uh, uh, Jérémy Régnier, who is a big French uh, actor, called eight of us saying, we cannot go along like this. We have to do something. And we met at the CNC, and this is a big difference with the, uh, what the, the, the Hollywood Climate Initiative was, is in France we have this big purveyor of subsidies for, for the movie industry, and if you do not obey what they are, what the, their criteria, you cannot have the money from, from, uh, from the state. And in France, uh, the movie industry is highly uh, subsidized. Um, so they have a good, they have a great power to, you know, force any professional in the industry to follow some rules. So we, we gather and uh, we had this idea of uh, launching a, a platform, an uh, internet platform, where we will gather all the initiatives that are already existing to produce, write and distribute stories that matters. Um, and uh, not only, well, we, we have started this uh, internet uh, platform, but we are launching working groups because this is just the beginning. Uh, we have to do better, uh, again, when we are writing our stories, when we are producing our stories. And the big, um, where I'm going to put a lot of my energy is on the distribution, on the impact. Uh, what you were saying is that there's too many films. <laughs> we are just we are we are just like uh, s swamped by all the content everywhere, and we and the, the the content that matters or can help us survive. Here, I think I can say that the the content that can help us survive is diluted. You have to really really uh, spend time looking for it, um, because there's no money for it. Nobody believes in it because it's not going to make a lot of money. So when you do this kind of film, you have to have another agenda. But you have to have partners that believe in your agendas. And for the moment, the industry is really, really money driven. It's like any industry. So where do you find the protection? What kind of, of corridor can you put in place so that that movie of you, of you that that is speaking to you know just as big as an animal or animal every every. Cyril Dion's work, etc., find um, some path in the distribution um, moment of their life where they can uh, fight back when there's a Spider-Man or a James Bond movie that is coming and just gonna kill it. You know, it's just like like the 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 the, the theater would would erase you from the screen. So we have to protect these kind of films. And this is what we're going to do. So the, the collective's uh, name is Cut for Cinéma pour un uh, co oui, Cinéma collect Collectif pour un Cinéma uni pour la transition. 
It's very new, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that good at, at pitching it. But it's, it's, it's really um, a very important moment in the industry because one of the things that we are all realizing, whether we are activists or filmmakers or whatever, is that we have to come together. We're not going to make it alone. It's the, the moment where we were fighting for budget, fighting for attention, etc., is over. We have to, to you know, gather our strength and, and help each other because uh, there's too many forces against that. Um, and we're going to be stronger together. So that was a, a, a good push to go uh, at Cannes and go back in the red carpet between two TikTokers. Um, that was kind of the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you both very much. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you, sir, Sigrid and Flo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Okay, so next up we have two wonderful uh, young people. We have Belalak and uh, Vipulan. Now I apologize now, Vipulan, with the surname. It's uh, Puvaneswaran. I got a nod, so it was good, it was good. Oh, careful with the steps. Um, so, so Bella has been campaigning for a very, very long time. They're, they're both the stars of the animal film, as um, Flor just mentioned. Uh, she's done TEDx talks uh, in 2019. Last year, she published a book. And uh, Vibulan himself is an ecological activist, uh, the co-star of the film, and also the book of, again, I'm going to apologize for my pronunciation, uh, Autonomies Animales Ouvrir des Frontes de Lutte Interespecies, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> so we welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Oh. Have a mic. Um, so, I'm going to start with Bella, because you're closest. Um, what is Animal, and how can it become one of those before and after films that we have? So, um, Animal is a film that we filmed in 2019, in the beginning of 2020, with, directed by Cyril Dion. Um, and it's essentially me and Vipalan going on a mission to meet economists and politicians, activists, farmers, and they all have solutions to what's called the sixth mass extinction, which is basically the mass devastation of life on Earth. Um, and your question about before and after is an interesting one, because I think often within environmentalism, we see actions uh, independently. And what we need to start doing is seeing, seeing those actions within an ecosystem. Because, for example, Cyril's first film, Demat, at the beginning, it was, sorry to Cyril, it just wasn't a success for the first Bit. And then now, if you look at lots of films which have been predecessors of that film, they have f uh, followed the model of being solution-based, being futuristic, um, being positive. And so the impact is huge and vast, but based on the first, the first sort of measure su of success, it's hard to say it was a success at the beginning. And in, in 2015, there was um, a case called the Juliana versus US case by 21 youth plaintiffs, basically putting in this lawsuit against suing the US government for its inaction on climate change. And the case failed. But as a response to that, there have been cases all over the world of young people doing the same and having being successful in suing their governments. So I think we kind of need to see actions as um, within an ecosystem. And then in hindsight, maybe in 20, 30 years, we can look back and say, look how far we've come. Look how little we're deforestation, how low our emissions are now. Um, Amazing. Now, I'm going to ask you, Vipulan, what is animal autonomy? Uh, that's a huge question. And so, yeah, it was more about the book that I wrote f with some two of my friends. And what we tried to, to say with that expression is that um, we need not only to take humans' opinion, but also to take into account the, uh, the agentivity of other animals. Uh, and that we, tr we, we should try to make society with in by taking into account other animals' uh, forms of expression that are not easy to understand, but we should do, try to do that. And one of our main proposition about uh, the, the stories, maybe, is that we should not only have movies and books and stuff like that, but that we should also create what we call a material culture. It means that we should have representations, but we should also have like new practices 
and uh, put put in place those practices in events and stuff like that, and that we should, and that it has a huge impact on creating representation. On creating representations, we just we don't need only stories, but also like other practices. And and I'd also like to, to continue with you, people. And can you see any connections to the rapid loss of biodiversity and other crises that we're living through at the moment? Yeah, completely. Uh, I think that, I mean, as lots of people and as have demonstrated today, um, lots of scientists and so on, the ecological crisis that we face today is because of an economic and a political system. The economic system is the capital, basically, because uh, we focus on just doing more and more profit and that uh, we, all our... Um, our society is focused on a concept which is called the economic value. I mean, today, you, me, all the people here, a tree, an animal, everything is, economic, is an economic value. And then maybe it could become a, a, merchandise, a merchandise. I don't know if it's a good word in English. Merchandise? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, um, it's the Marxist theory of, of the value that everything is, be is becoming value. So if we want to create an ecological society, we have to think without this concept of economical value, but more about interdependence, it interdependencies, sorry, and about uh, freedom, equality, and so on. So we've, we've talked a bit about you know, the, sig the sixth great mass extinction and, and capitalism and some things that aren't exactly great. So, so Bella, what positive changes can you see happening in the world right now? So political, institutional, that kind of thing. I think what is really great for us to remember is that all around the world there are little fragments of the future playing out and people creating a new world that we can live in. Um, and I was speaking to Louisa earlier, who's an incredible German um, climate activist, and she's often asked, are you um, an, opti an optimist or a pessimist? And she calls herself a possibilist because you know we're going to people and if we say to you if we say to people that we're trying to engage right we have this crisis get involved no one is going to get involved but if we go to them and say look at what we have we have all these possible solutions we have this future that we can create and here is your opportunity to join us come and join that's much more likely to um, engage people and an example is like in Costa Rica which we um, investigated for animal um, they've in 1998, they implemented a scheme called the PES scheme. And basically, they take money out of a carbon tax and they put it into reforestation. They reforested over 50% now. Um, their happiness rate has increased. They're one of the happiest countries in the world. And you know, there are countries around the world who are doing incredible things. There are individuals who, ha who are implementing incredible solutions. And at the same time, there are massive systems, corporations who are wrecking the planet. So we're kind of living in a very weird liminal period where it could go either way and where what we have to do is find these individuals, these governments, these companies who are doing their best, harness everything that they're doing and imagine this better world and then use those solutions, uplift them, amplify them. Now, I often think that people's treatment of animals is like a direct reflection of how we treat each other. So I was wondering, uh, Vibulan, how can we help people see this so we can move on to live in a world that's, that's free of oppression for, for all living beings? That's a huge question, and I think that I don't have the, <laughs> the exact answer, but um, we've talked about stories, and yeah, I think that we should use like all the means that we have. Education is a strong, is a strong thing in which we have to, to involve, uh, because today in education we don't, talk about that and we focus on economic value, as I said just before. I mean, at least in the major part of education in the world. Uh, and yeah, and we, tr we should try to, to, to think the ecological fights in link with the, the workers who work in the, in, for example, in the coal factories, in, in the petrol factories, um, in the slaughterhouses, and those kinds of things, because People uh, who who work in those kind of sectors are also exploited by the by 
the system which is destroying also the, the biodiversity and the living li the living life in in the in his role possibilities <laughs> it, it's a, a great that that reflects quite well back to the the territory the film we were talking about before where you see the land grabbers but you can see the the influence that's come from above them and and so one of the reasons that that they are doing it now the next question is one that is very personal to me. Now, my daughter, she's nine, um, actually Belly, or one of, one of her top five activists she mentioned to me today. Um, now, she does a lot of work and people always say, oh, wow, she's the next Greta or something like that. Or, wow, she's inspirational. Oh, she's so brave. And often, you know, young activists are that kind of, okay, you're brave and inspirational, so you go do your talk and then we'll all feel great and then we'll move on. So I want to know, how can we move on from, from young activists just being brave and inspirational? And how can we ensure that the ideas of younger generations are being taken seriously? I, it's just a really weird time where up until now in history, throughout history, um, you know, even as primates, the adults have been disciplining the kids. And we're suddenly at a time where it's like the adults are waiting to be disciplined by the kids, right? And they're... I've had like politicians, people in organizations I've worked with who are sitting there and saying, okay, this is going to be a youth space. I'm going to sit back and we'll let you young activists do it. And I'm kind of sitting there thinking, like you've, you've set up this organization, you've built it up and now you're here asking us just to take it over. Um, and I think what we need is more intergener intergenerational spaces. And today, Change Now is a really, really good example because there hasn't been this division of, I've been to one youth meeting, apart from that though, there's been intergenerational panels and there hasn't, it hasn't felt patronizing in the way that um, people are sitting back and watching uh, youth spaces, I guess. So I think what we need is engagement at every level and I hope, one of the big things is I hope this COP will be better because at uh, COP26, they had invited young people, many young activists, who were then made to sit outside and watch the proceedings on their computer. So it's a bit like, if you're going to invite young people, don't make it tokenistic, make it deep engagement. And maybe about that. Uh... <laughs> don't clap because I'm young. <laughs> Um, maybe about that, in f at least in France, we often talk about the, the generational fracture that young people are more committed and young people are more concerned about that. But for me, uh, that's not true because, I mean, in young people, some, some people want to work for big compa companies like Total and stuff like that. And some people are committed. And in the same way, uh, in all the generations, uh, some people are are committed and some are not. I mean, I think that we are not in the same generation. No, no we're not. I, I might but look young, but you know, I am, I'm not actually Gen Z. But, but we, we, we try to, to commit both, uh, both of us. So the question is not really the generational fracture, but the social fracture. I think that if we look, for example, who is creating the, the logics of uh, exploitation, of oppression, of alienation, it is a social fracture and not a generational fracture. It's so true because, you know, at home at the moment, in, back in Spain where I live, there's my, my nan who's 88 and she's the person who's most obsessed with not wasting water in the world. There's, there's my parents who are, are both vegan and my dad is the most obsessed with anyone I've ever met about solar panels and solar energy. And then there's my daughter as well. So it's clearly, you know, th there is the, that consciousness across generations it's not just okay young people want to change so let's let them do it you know there is that consciousness and we do need to to bring them together but i'd like to know so for all generations out there looking on thinking how can i be like vipulan how can i be like bella what what would you say to them um i really doubt anyone's thinking that because honestly i haven't i've never met an activist or a campaigner who is perfect in the sense that we often imagine. So we imagine this sustainable future, this utopia, and we need to completely abolish this idea of perfection. Um, I think more than just being damaging to us as individuals, we all know if, if you hold a really high ideal for yourself, you're not going to live up for it. It's also, 
impeding our progress, I think, environmentally and as a society, because we need to accept there are solutions out there, there are solutions which we, we hear and then we kind of immediately disagree with, but right now, there's this thing called cathedral thinking, which is that we start building the foundation without actually knowing what the cathedral is going to look like. And that's exactly what we need to do because we can't sit back and wait for a perfect, ideal, utopian future. Um, you know, people are proposing things, some governments are doing things, some are doing nothing, and what we need to do is latch onto the thing, the solutions which are being proposed. Excellent, and what do you think, Vipulan? Uh, I think I do agree with what you said, but uh, yeah, the, the, the purpose is not to, to become like somebody uh, who, is, uh, who has some attention in media and stuff, but trying to, to, to have impact and trying to be efficient on the way you, you, you fight against, uh, against and for better, a better world in a way. Now, you, you were both activists before the film, obviously, because um, otherwise you wouldn't have been selected for the film. That would be kind of strange. But how has making the film like pushed you forward and, and given you, I don't know, has it given you more confidence in what you do, or how has it changed your direction? I was just very cynical before the film, I think. Um, <laughs> Cyril came to me. I was doing a lot of campaigning about uh, animals specifically, I very rarely looked at the human element. I kind of just hated humanity and everything we were doing to the planet as still a, you know, little, a little bit there, colonel. Yeah. Um, but I think when we were doing the film, now I've learned one of the big lessons is before I was trying to reach people um, through the issues. And now I kind of try and reach the issue through human element and through using people's stories because we were meeting all these individuals who had incredible stories and also realizing what you discussed earlier about how intersectional it is and you can't really extricate one issue without looking at many other issues. Um, so I think the biggest thing I learned is first of all, um, actually there's a really great quote by Mary Hegler which is we shouldn't be over, just overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem. We should also fall in love with the creativity of the solution. So one big thing is focusing on the creativity. Um, and then what I said earlier about perfectionism, I think. Amazing. Vipulan, how has it changed you? How has the film changed your view on, on activism? Um, you said in the introduction when you presented us that uh, I was an ecological activist. And I think that that's an important point. Uh, for me, um, I would say that, in a way, both of us uh, moved from an environmental perspective to an ecological perspective, uh, which means that for environmentalism uh, is, in a way, uh, think wanting to protect a nature which, is, uh, which does not have humans inside, uh, which is essentialized, and which is, in a way, um, accomplice of the, of, the eco of the actual economic system which thinks that nat nature is only a, an exploitable value, you know? And in a way, uh, in the idea of environmentalism, we also have sometimes the idea of uh, fighting against climate change and fighting against the biodiversity loss is um, more, maybe it's more important than other fights. But in fact, lots of people are dying and are oppressed because of other other causes. Like we talked about capitalism, we can talk about like racism and patriarchy and so on. And the thing is that uh, I don't think that environmentalism is a um, is a way of thinking that uh, that tries to, to, uh, to, to think the world with, just, with real justice. Um, and compared to that, ecology is historically first a science, a science that tries to, to understand the relations between living beings, but also between living beings, beings sorry, uh, and the, the environment in a way. So ecology as a fight is a fight to um, rethink in a way and also act other other forms of relations that are liberating uh, 
built towards uh, non-humans, but also humans. So one final kind of question now. Watching the film, I, I took an awful lot away from it, and I felt a huge amount of positivity um, after, you know, after it finished. I was just like, yeah, there are solutions. There are things that we can work for. I was wondering, how do you hope that this film will inspire other people of all generations, of all different backgrounds? I really think that um, most people are fundamentally quite good. And um, I think the problem is that we're all, we sort of kind of believe in the story that our government tells us. And um, it happened in America, what Donald Trump told a story, hate the man, but told a good story about make America great again. And humans believe in the restoration story. And what we need to do, I hope people take from the film, is that we can each create a different narrative, a different type of restoration, um, which is what I talked about earlier. So we're going to go to people and give them not a crisis, but an opportunity. And we are living in a crisis, um, but it can also be turned on its head and used as a chance to create a much better world, a much more amicable society where we're more compassionate, where kids can play in the street because there aren't as many cars, where we have stronger communities, less air pollution, more biodiversity in cities. Um, and I think that's something really beautiful to look forward to. And all of the people that we met in the film, yes, they were overwhelmed, they had had moments of burnout, but they also, they kind of had this big belief in this vision and in this future. And I just, if anything, hope that people take away from the film um, that sense of vision and possibility that we're kind of treading on, but we need to just grasp and follow, chase. Yeah. I don't think I have, I don't think that ha I have something to add to it. No, nothing to add there? Amazing. Um, well, thank you both very much. You are not only inspirational and brave, you're much more than that. Um, so thank you so much for coming along today um, and thank sharing you. your ideas with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.